Welcome everyone to Run It Back. Here with myself, Ryan Cartman. And Gabriel Steiger. So glad you're here. It was a big week in Lawrence and all around the world of sports. The Jayhawks took home victories in basketball and football, as well as a conference championship in soccer. Mm -hmm. Alex will be giving us all the details here on that in just a little bit. But before we get there, it was a big week for the football team at Arrowhead as they took down the vaunted Cyclones of Iowa State. That's right, Ryan. Here's what Coach Leipold had to say this morning as the Jayhawks head to Provo to take on BYU Saturday. Every year there's going to be a team that kind of comes out of nowhere in this conference. I think it's going to be a trend that we'll continue to see. I think obviously TCU was that team. I think Baylor was probably in 21. There's always somebody that kind of comes up. I think we, we had our moments. Of, of of playing really good and getting national notoriety. I, I think if there's one that's really, I mean, Colorado's right there. Iowa State was there as well. Um, but BYU is that story about a program that that people kind of forgot about, that kind of went about it. I think uh, they deserve this. And and again, we have a lot of respect for them. We know it's going to be a unique challenge to to go into their in, into their stadium and, and and to play in that environment and. Uh, you know, we're going to need to be at our best. Ryan, how do you feel about that matchup coming up? Well, look, Provo, I just checked, 4,500 plus feet in elevation. Jayhawks haven't had an environment like that this season. <laughs> you also got their most raucous away crowd or home crowd they're going to be visiting this year. I know you could talk about K-State or teams like that, but look, Lave Lave Edwards Field at Lavelle Edwards Stadium, whatever the heck it's called, is probably the toughest place to play in the Big 12. Um, we thought they wanted the K-State. We thought they would get blown out. They kept it close. I think, though, this one's going to be a two-score two game, probably, for in, in favor of BYU. In favor, in favor, in favor of BYU. BYU. I would guess the same thing. The Jayhawks are hot right now. Uh, I like the optimism, a, though. I, 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 yeah. I want optimism. But it, was yeah. a, it was a really nice game against Iowa State, and I'm happy where it ended up. Um, if that offense can come mm -hmm. out on the field again, that'd be great. But mm -hmm. like you said, it's going to be a tough mm -hmm. environment. I think we're going to... It's good to have, momentum. Be it's good to have gonna... momentum going into this game, though. Yeah, hopefully mm -hmm. there's, you know, oxygen tanks on yeah. the sidelines or something. Well, folks, we've got another wonderful show coming your way. That's right. And as basketball season kicked off last week, we've got the inside look from Bianca on some changes to the environment down the road at Allen Fieldhouse, along with Alex bringing us some soccer coverage once again. Mm -hmm. But before we get there, we're going to keep it right here and talk some KU baseball. That's right, the MLB season just wrapped up, as we all know, and back on Halloween, the Big 12 announced their official baseball schedules for the upcoming season. With play commencing February 14th for the Jayhawks in Southeast Texas against Texas A&M of Corpus Christi. They won't return home until February 27th when the University of Nebraska Omaha comes to Hogland Ballpark for a four game set. This is a program that doesn't get nearly enough love here on campus, and I'm here to help change that. Last year, the Jayhawks played really well in comparison to their recent season performances, finishing 31-23, uh, and 23, excuse me, and 515-15 and 15 in conference play. Uh, they were bounced from the Big 12 tournament against the University of Oklahoma after making a run all the way to the semifinals. They were not College World Series eligible, unfortunately. In fact, only once in program history under Hall of Fame head coach Dave Bingham, which you can see right now, that was in 1993. Speaking of coaches, two seasons ago, Kansas hired head coach Dan Fitzgerald, who has turned around the program's culture mightily. Fitz is responsible last season for the most players given MLB contracts in program history. Whether through the draft or through free agency, he and the Jayhawks have tied the number for most conference wins in program history, like I mentioned earlier, at 15 and 15. And the recruiting has been everything, including stellar, especially in pulling players from junior colleges. The Hawks did suffer some losses this past offseason, most notably Cody Shojinaga, who was taken in the sixth round of the MLB draft by the Phillies. But not to worry, last year's first team freshman All-American arm, Dominic Vagley, is back in the rotation and slotted to be the team's Saturday starter. The team also boasts 28 newcomers to their roster. Fall scrimmages and exhibitions have wrapped up for the Jayhawks as they head into the winter offseason, but don't forget to pack the hog this spring as the Kansas baseball Jayhawks are primed for another program-defining season. Now let's head over to Bianca, who has the latest on those changes made to Allen Fieldhouse. Thanks, Gabe and Ryan, for that great baseball update. The Jayhawks, the Jayhawks look in the spring, but before it's baseball season, let's talk some KU basketball. The Kansas basketball team kicked off the winning weekend with a huge win over UNC, 92-89. But before we talk about the game, let's talk about the newly renovated Allen Fieldhouse. With updates to multiple areas of the historic arena, including a new center video board, public Wi-Fi in the Fieldhouse, a brand new court with new circus font, 
and a new sound system. But with the new renovations, over 1,000 seats were removed from the historic field house, sparking fan commentary on social media. The decrease in capacity came as a result of new video boards in the corners of the stands and renovations to the improved third level. To improve the third level concourse, it was necessary to open up and modernize by adding proper lighting, restrooms, and concessions to better improve the fan experience. The importance of the corners and the redesign was crucial, according to Athletic Director Travis Goff. Though these corners took away some of the seating on the third level, no student seating was lost in the renovation. The new field house looked amazing and felt electric on Friday night. The Jayhawks defeated UNC in the front of a sold-out crowd, 92-89. It was just the 13th matchup of the Tar Heels and the Jayhawks, and first since Kansas rallied from a 16-point deficit to win the 2022 National Championship. The only other time they have met on campus was in 1960. Jayhawk starters Hunter Dickinson and Zeke Mayo led the way with 20 and 21 points. Both players played a huge part in KU's first half lead, with Mayo scoring 10 points and Dickinson at 7 with 5 rebounds. This allowed KU to go into halftime up 49-29. But when KU really needed them most, they showed up for the team. The Jayhawks trailed 87-83 with 3.28 to go. Dickinson and Mayo responded with a series of baskets to tie the game at 89. A Mayo jumper followed by a Dickinson basket allowed them to gain a two-point lead with 1.15 to go. Hunter Dickinson made a free throw with 12 seconds remaining to make it a three-point game. UNC had one more possession and a chance to tie up the game, but Elliott Cadeau missed a three-pointer, allowing KU to win the game 92-89. The Jayhawks were able to put the game away and continue their winning streak. Up next, the Kansas plays Michigan State tomorrow night at 5.30 p.m. in Atlanta, so make sure to tune in. Now, I'll send it over to Ben to hear about KU football continuing the Kansas winning weekend. Thanks, Ben, for the game breakdown on Kansas football's strong win on Saturday. Well, folks, our Lady Jayhawks have completed the impossible. As the number six seed going into the tournament, they won four games in a row to win the Big 12 tournament and punch their ticket to the NCAA tournament. Before we get to talking about the championship, let's bring it back to the semifinal match last Wednesday. The big name from the 2-1 to one win over number 17 Texas Tech was sophomore Olivia Page. She doesn't often end up in the spotlight with being a defender, but she sure made her name known during that match. Just four minutes into the second half, Paige scored the second goal for the Jayhawks. That goal by Paige was her first goal of the season, and for Kansas, it could not have come at a better time. Paige, who is originally from Shawnee, Kansas, has been a lifelong Jayhawk fan. fan. She chose the Jayhawks over other Division I powerhouses, including Nebraska and Purdue. When asked why she decided to pursue KU, she said, I've always wanted to play here since I was a little girl. I love the environment, the facility, the coaching staff, and the players. I just couldn't see myself going to any other college other than Kansas. Now, let's talk about the game you all really want to know about, the Big 12 championship match. TCU has been a difficult opponent for the Jayhawks in recent history. Kansas had a five-game losing streak going into the matchup, and with TCU being ranked number seven in the nation, I can sure see why. The player that I think that really needs to be recognized in this match is Sophie Daw. Daw has been a valuable asset to the Jayhawks, 
all season, which is even more impressive given she's a redshirt freshman. Against TCU, she saved four shots on goal and led Kansas to the 2-1 to victory. So far, she has an average save percentage of 71.9, which I know will only get better as she gets further in her career. As Big 12 champs, all Kansas has to do is wait till 3 p.m. today for the selection show on NCAA.com to tell them when and where they will be playing their first round game. When we come back, Gabe and Ryan will be here to give us a rundown on some high school and professional sports around the country. You may not hear it at first, but it's there. Our chant, rising. On this summit, callings converge. Voices unify into a chorus. That sounds out for good. For greatness. Can you hear it? Finally, long-awaited high school football has returned this week in the state of Kansas as Jacob heads uh, towards some postseason action in Blue Valley Northwest High School, I believe, in Gardner Edgerton, uh, where they took on. I actually don't know. Who did they take on, Ryan? I guess uh, we'll find out. We'll find out. Yeah, more good news, though. Jude's Fantasy Five has returned, and Grant will be bringing us some NBA action. But first, let's go over to Jacob. Thanks, Gabe. It has been a while since I have been on camera, but I am finally back with some good high school football news as we just got done with the regional round of the playoffs. Headed over to defending 6A champs, Gardner Edgerton. They were coming off a big win against Wyandotte, 63-0, so you know they mean business when it comes to being back-to-back -back state champs. Now, I have never covered a Shawnee Mission East game, and unfortunately for them, they were the Trailblazers' latest victim. Now, per usual, Gardner scores on the first possession of the game, and I remember saying after that drive that I needed to see how East responds on the next drive to see if they'll be competitive in this game or not. But things turn south for East real quick. Let's watch this clip. Yeah, it was never close. Gardner was by far the more dominant team in all phases of the game. Gardner won 42-7, winning regionals for the third year in a row. Now for the team they'll be facing in sectionals, Lawrence Free State or Blue Valley Northwest. Now this game I knew was going to be close, and at halftime the Huskies were up 14-7. But then Free State, with the season on the line, at the worst possible time and in the worst possible way, they started to collapse. On Free State's first possession in the second half, they turned it over on downs on their own side of the field, and then Northwest hit them with an immediate touchdown. Now, this next drive for Free State is very important as they need a score to stay in the game, but senior Trevor Garlington thought otherwise and got himself a nice pick six for the Huskies, who are now leading 28 to seven. And I bet you can't guess what happened on Free State's next possession, another pick, which led to another Northwest touchdown. The Huskies beat Free State 49 to 14, which means they will have the opportunity to redeem themselves from last year's loss against Braven and Gardner the defending champs. Now tossing it to Grant with some NBA news about a former Jayhawk. Thank you for that high school football rundown, Jacob. Now doing a complete 180, the Jayhawks 2024 to 2025 season is underway and things are off to a promising start. Speaking of promising Jayhawks, today's NBA deep dive is into no other than Christian Brown. Brown started his KU career in 2019 and boy, did he make a huge difference. After winning the 2022 national championship, Christian Brown went on to be drafted by the Denver Nuggets as the 21st pick in the 2022 NBA draft. In Christian Brown's first year in the league, he averaged 4.7 points per game, and the Nuggets would go on to win the NBA Finals against the Miami Heat. Brown had just won the college NCAA tournament with the Kansas Jayhawks, and the following year, he wins the NBA Finals with the Nuggets. Starting year two, Brown started to make a name for himself, and he started frequently appearing on the court alongside the other Nuggets superstars. Brown truly started to show his potential that flashed while he played in Allen Fieldhouse. Flash forward to the 2024-2025 NBA season, Brown has solidified himself among the starting five for Denver. His playmaking and shot creation have helped him exceed expectations. His defense is not to be forgotten either, as Brown often makes hustle plays that result in highlights. Brown has gone from winning in high school to winning in the best environment in college basketball to now being a superstar on a top NBA team. 
Brown's development has gotten him into the most improved players watch list for the 2024 to 2025 season. The Nuggets start the season 7-3 after a very impressive performance from Brown and the rest of the team. Now that was a quick deep dive into Jayhawks and NBA. Now, I've been losing my fantasy matchups recently. Jude, is there any way you could help me out? Thanks, Grant. I'll do my best. Fantasy 5 is back, and Week 10 got off to a hot start in a Thursday night shootout between the Ravens and Bengals. The Ravens captured the win, but the star of the game was Jamar Chase. Chase finished with 55.4 points, marking the highest scoring fantasy performance of the 2024 season. Joe Burrow connected with Chase for three touchdowns, two of which came from 70 yards out. Chase finished the game with an unreal stat line. 11 receptions, 264 yards, and 3 touchdowns. Surprisingly though, Chase's 55.4 fantasy points isn't even his highest scoring game of his career, as in 2022, he had 55.6 points. Jamar Chase is the full package and he will continue to be a top draft pick in fantasy leagues for years to come. After a mediocre start to the season, Bijan Robinson has been on a tear for the past 5 weeks finishing as a top 10 fantasy running back in each start. Since week six against Carolina, Bijan is averaging 129 yards per game and has reached the end zone six times. Bijan is showing his versatility as a pass catcher, which we all know provides a massive bump in fantasy scoring for running backs. Robinson's 29.4 points in week 10 against the Saints is his highest scoring game of the season. And outside of the Chargers and Vikings, he has some easy defenses remaining on the schedule, just in time for playoffs. In his 12th NFL season, Travis Kelsey is looking like his former self. The past three weeks, after a frustrating start to the season, he has really resurged. He has been getting increased looks from Mahomes with 32 receptions since week 8. The highlights you are seeing right now are actually from last week's game, where Kelsey broke his career high for receptions in a game with 14. The addition of DeAndre Hopkins has seemed to open things up for Kelsey, as he is reasserting himself as an extremely valuable fantasy asset. Arguably the best fantasy football player of the last 10 years, Christian McCaffrey made his season debut against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. McCaffrey couldn't get going much in the run game, as he only tallied 39 yards on 13 attempts, but he held his own in the receiving game, going for 68 yards on 6 catches. This is McCaffrey's first game back from injury, so expect his touches to really ramp up within the next two weeks. Consistency is one of the most important factors when determining fantasy value, and this season, Terry McLaurin has been the king of consistency. The 29-year-old receiver has been thriving with the addition of Jaden Daniels to the Washington offense. McLaurin, he hasn't been playing out of this world, but he has been providing fantasy managers with a consistent scoring output in the mid-teens week after week. And you can't ask any more from a player who, on average, was the 30th receiver taken in drafts. This has been the Fantasy Five, and Gabe and Ryan will be back after the break. And stay, stay tuned for an exciting close to our show, including our first roundtable of the semester. From adversity, we rose. We made history and became pioneers, voyagers, champions, Jayhawks. And when our chant rises, haunting and hallowed, Jayhawks are telling the world what's near. Victory. Down to Scrubs Front here in the studio, and we've got some college basketball, an exclusive interview, and Gabe looking to defend his crown on Cooper's Guessing Game segment. That's right, Ryan. We'll see how it goes uh, here in just a little bit, folks. But before that, we've got Case, Emmett, and Grant to talk some college basketball as we head into the season. Gentlemen. Thanks, Ryan and Gabe. I'm here alongside two college basketball experts as college basketball is returning. We have Emmett Swinsai, Grant Shear. We're going to be looking at three different college basketball teams, seeing what we think of them, do we think they're too high, too low, and how we expect them to do later on in the year. Emmett, you're going with a college basketball team in Alabama. They're ranked that's number right. two. Talk to me on what you like about them. I mean, I think that's just right. They have a great coach, and they oh, it's really like them. Took them to the, or the Final Four for the the first time last year and they're doing good because their biggest worry for me was getting Mark Sears big time point guard up for national player of the year he comes back for his fifth year they have Grant Nelson who I really liked how he played for them last year came in as a transfer from North Dakota State 
And then they also picked up some guys in the portal, such as Clifford Amori. He's been big. He's a center for them, adding to the height, adding to the big play with uh, Grant Nelson. And I also like Aiden Holloway. Stayed in state, was an Auburn freshman guard last year, came to Alabama, and uh, he's been playing solid for them. Glad to see that he's getting his groove a little back. Thought he was going to be way better than he was last year's freshman year. So, I mean, I think they're going to be really good this year. I think they're ranked just right. They're a national championship contender to me. You mentioned that veteran play from Mark Sears and Grant Nelson, a team that does not have very many veterans and is not known for one is Duke. Grant, you like the Duke Blue Devils. Talk to me on that one. You know, they are ranked number seven starting off the year, and I think they should be higher. I think number seven for this loaded of a Duke roster, a little shaky. But in their first game against the Maine Black Bears, they beat the Bears 96-62, to and they were led by a bunch of scores. You know, we had the lead scorer, Con Knipple. He had 22 points. Cooper Flagg, another freshman, he played great. We have Tyrese Proctor and Caleb Foster. Those were the leaders on that team, and honestly, they played great. You know, they might not have a seasoned veteran, but they do have some guys that have played some years. Um, they have really good freshmen that are going to be in the league next year. Cooper Flagg is looking like possibly the number one overall pick in the NBA draft. And we saw him this summer playing with some NBA stars, and he looked really good against some NBA stars. So I think, honestly, any team that's got him on it should be ranked the only, top The five. only college uh, player to be on the NBA or the USA Select team, and he looked like he was just Great. right there he with was, them. He was going up against NBA Elite, and he was holding his own. So yeah, he was. You know, I think he's going to have a great year. Yeah, absolutely. And while the Duke Blue Devils, they do not have a lot of experience on their hands, a team I really like that does is the Arkansas Razorbacks. We mentioned they get John Calipari early on in the offseason. They go in and they pick up a ton of recruits in the portal. They ended up getting Zvonimir Ivicic. He came from Kentucky, came over to Arkansas with Calipari. John L. Davis, a very talented player who's been in the name of college basketball for a while. He comes over from FAU, a team that has had success in March Madness. And so overall, I think this Arkansas team is good. They have a lot of depth. They have youth. They have good five stars. Boogie Fland, he has been absolutely incredible. Unreal. And he just seeing this team come together, with all the youth and the talent is, is really why I think they're going to be a good team. All right, question for you. Do you think they're going to move up higher than number 16 on the AP Top 25? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that 16 spot was just kind of there because the committee didn't know where they wanted to put Arkansas or how good yeah. they would be. I think after watching them play teams such as Kansas in the exhibition game, I think they'll go up. Yeah, that's, I'm not mad about that. I like that take. They're definitely, I think they're overlooked, especially they didn't know how Calipari was going to fit in with that, taking that whole new team, whether they could bring in recruits or not, bring Kentucky players over or not. They're going to be solid for sure. Now that was an exciting College Hoops roundtable. Now let's see how well I fare with KU Hoops knowledge. In this week's game show, I take on Gabe in an elite matchup. Take it away, Coop. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to play guessing games. Here's your host, Rupert Hannon. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We got ourselves another exquisite episode of guessing games, Battle of the Mustaches. So why don't we go and send it down and introduce them? Go ahead. <laughs> my, name, my name is Grant Shear. First time. Uh, a uh, guesser, so I'm excited. Uh, I was here last week. My name is uh, Gabriel. I'm the wonderful host, I guess. Let's do it. All right, fellas. Well, let's get right into it. What do we got today? Oh, KU oh, basketball. Boy. All right. So the season just got underway pretty recently. So that's why we got ourselves some KU basketball knowledge. So let's move on right into question one. How about it? Who was the head coach before Bill Self? Who was the head coach or who was a head coach before? Bill Self. The head coach before Bill Self. It is not Fog Allen, but that is my guess. <laughs> it is not. Uh, Grant, would you like to steal and try to take a point, or is it just going to be zeros on the board? Just give it zeros on the board. Yeah. Yeah. Zeros on the board, not even a guess. Thing, guys. guys, come on. <laughs> come on, let's see it. It was Roy Williams. Was oh, of course it was that. Roy Williams. Yeah, sorry. You know, yeah, Roy. sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. All right, well, let's move on to question two. Hopefully, it'll be better for you guys. Here we go. 
There's one starter left from the national championship that is still on the roster today. I saw that, Grant. I'll give it to you. Dewan Harris. Dewan Harris would be the correct answer. Grant, you are up to an early one nothing lead. All right. There go. It's still a lot of ball game left, so hey, don't count your chickens before they are hatched. <laughs> Move on to question three. Here we go. Former Jackrabbit. Not much. Oh, Grant! Zeke Mayo. <laughs> Zeke Mayo would be correct <laughs> once again. Grant, you are up 2 nothing. Oh, not mustard. Oh. Not mustard. You know, like mayo mustard <laughs> yeah, on the sandwich? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so 2 nothing. Question four. Let's see it. This former Jayhawk is only the fifth player to. Oh! Christian Brown. Oh, I knew wow. It I knew Can't I'm even get the question off with this guy. guy. Wow. All right, well, let's see if that's the correct answer. You are correct. Three, nothing. Okay. Okay. This is interesting because, well, let's see the next thing. It's triple points. All right, triple points. So what we're looking at is a 3-0 lead right now, Grant. All right, you're at three, nothing. Gabe, you can come back and tie. And if you tie, there will be a bonus question oh that your lovely host will make up on the spot. So let's see it. <laughs> question five. Besides 2022, name a year in... Oh! 1967. Gabe. What was that? 1967. 1967 is not the correct answer. What happened? Uh, unfortunately... Are you 2008? 2008 is oh. the correct answer, yeah! yeah. Dang. <laughs> is it not? It, there's like six of them. Sweep. What? Sweep. No. We have four. like six... <laughs> we have four, actually. I thought we had six. <laughs> <laughs> no! So, that was a stone cold sweep. <laughs> Let's send it down to Grant. How do you feel about this victory? Oh, you know, honestly, this is just another day in the office. <laughs> this is another day in the office. I'm a ball knower. I guess I'm not. I definitely not. I don't. I can't even go to the school anymore. My, <laughs> <laughs> he might have to enter the transfer portal, oh, ladies six. and gentlemen. 0 oh for 6 in an elimination game. Ladies and gentlemen, that's your host. <laughs>well grant we have some special breaking news i'm hearing word inside you will be playing jacob next week <laughs> to stay if you could stay on the king of the hill hopefully right. jacob if you're out there you will be playing <laughs> grant next week and that's it ladies hey, and gentlemen once there. again have a Great lovely job. night we'll see you next time thanks cooper oh do you want to talk about it? No, I don't want to talk about it. Well, at least KU did a lot of winning this week. Uh-huh. Let's hope good things continue to happen for the Jayhawks as the football team heads to Provo to take on undefeated BYU. As the basketball team will head up to Michigan State before returning home on Saturday to take on Oakland. And folks, before we go, we'll squeeze this in. We've got a brand new segment right here to wrap up the show. Mm-hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Gabe's Play of the Week. If you can think of a more creative name, please send us an email or something. Well, Gabe, I've only got one question for you. What was the play of the week? Let's roll it. That, we do not have the clip. We're cutting the segment. I'm so sorry, everybody. Well, let's just pretend it was a Chiefs well, field hey, goal. Let's just say it was a Chiefs. It was, it was going to be the, uh, the Chiefs block field goal. That's what it was mm -hmm. going to be. Yeah. Sorry about that, everybody. Well, either way, make sure to catch Playmakers and Good Morning KU Sports on Friday morning. And for Gabe, myself, and everybody in the studio, thanks for running it back with us. Mm -hmm. Let's run it back next week.